title of the article is Data Protection, Colon, We Can Innovate, comma, Leapfrog. And uh, all I'm really doing at this talk is taking you through the article with one modification. The article has four models. I'm going to introduce uh, the fifth one, which I left out when I wrote the article. Thank you for coming for this uh, talk. Uh, this is a policy talk, not a technical talk, and it's immediately after lunch. So with most policy talks, we have the me-go syndrome, which is my eyes are glazing over. And with uh, the lunch demanding blood in your tummy, your eyes are going to glaze over twice over. So my apologies for doing this uh, to you. Uh, I'm basically talking about privacy enhancing technologies uh, and perhaps the best way to think about it is the introduction of digital cameras in Korea and Japan 20 years ago and with the introduction of the technology came the phenomena of upskirt photography and then you have Lawmakers in both these countries respond to the social harm by requiring the principle of notice to be implemented in the digital camera. So they said, you must go out and make an MP3 recording of an analog shutter. And every time the noiseless digital shutter moves, you have to play the MP3 file of the manual shutter. And that is the implementation of the principle of notice within a device. And it is a requirement by law. And if you turn it off, or if the manufacturer gave you the option to turn it off, that would be illegal in those two markets. In India, uh, we see that legal innovation at play, but we don't really know the 20-year history behind that. So that is uh, what we're dealing with, privacy-enhancing technologies. And uh, the unique proposal we're making, uh, at least in the Indian context, is that given that about 27% of our population is illiterate and only 10% of the population can read and write English, and even within that 10% of the population, most of us are unfamiliar with uh, legal vocabulary. So therefore, even though we know English, we might read a privacy notice or we might read the terms of use, and we may not understand its import completely. So how much are we supposed to read? My friend Pat Walsh looked at the video game Tetris, and he found out that behind Tetris, there exists 123 ad networks, 13 online analytics companies, 62 mobile advertising networks, and 14 mobile analytics companies. And if you put the privacy policies of all these corporations together, which is what you're signing up when you sign up to play Tetris, then it comes up to 4 lakh and 7,000 words, which compares with Lord of the Rings, which is 4 lakh 50,000 words. So it is not something that most of us are going to read. And therefore, in order to protect those of us who don't have the ability to read, or cannot read in the right language, or are unfamiliar with legal terminology, the proposal in India from a variety of sources is that we should have intermediaries in the data protection regime. Uh, Justice Sri Krishna and his committee, after doing a series of open house discussions, are now working on what this draft law should look like. So it is a high probability that one of these ideas might enter the draft that Justice Sri Krishna pr produces. So the first bunch of people that started thinking about intermediaries were the folk at Ice Spirit. And uh, when Ice Spirit uh, thought about intermediaries, they called them consent collectors. And the DEPA team at Ice Spirit has published uh, the specification for a consent collector. What does iSpirit hope? That there is a data consumer and a data provider. So they are not really thinking about the data subject, which is the individual. They're thinking about a bank, which is an institution that can provide data, 
and they're thinking about a fintech company that could potentially consume the data that is provided by the bank. That is the uh, ecosystem or the map that they're looking at. If the data subject provides consent, then the consent artifact uh, can be collected by somebody called a consent collector. In their view, the consent collector can either be the bank, which is the data provider, or it can be the data consumer. So the consent collector could be the fintech company. As long as the consent collector con collects the consent, which has a particular data structure and can be uh, represented in XML, uh, then those transactions are kosher and fine. And that's the scheme uh, that iSpirit proposed. So it's the first version. And the iSpirit version is called consent collector. You move on to the next bunch of people that take the iSpirit idea forward. So the first implementation of the consent collector idea happens by the Reserve Bank of India. And the Reserve Bank of India, instead of calling them consent collector, now calls them account aggregators. So it's a slightly different name. And uh, what RBI does is it publishes non-banking financial company account aggregator directions. That is the rule that RBI uh, publishes, which gives these entities legal foundation. And this is published in September 2016. The schema is in these rules. So it is identity, optional contact information, nature of the financial information, uh, nature of the financial information requested, purpose, identity of the recipients, if any, URL address for notifications whenever the consent artifact is used, uh, consent artifact creation date, expiry date, identity signature, and digital signature of the account aggregator. So each consent artifact is doubly signed. It is signed first by the data subject using the e-sign infrastructure. And then there is a second signature provided by the account aggregator. And uh, any other attribute that may be prescribed by the RBI, that's uh, like most employment contracts. The final clause which says that everything else is possible. So this is an uh, interesting uh, addition to the work that uh, was already done in iSpirit. Uh, how this is different from iSpirit is in the original iSpirit vision, they didn't really think of the account aggregator actually holding on to your personal data. So here, uh, uh, there is some amount of personal data that financial information in particular that uh, the account aggregator can hold on to. Again, there is no prohibition who you can make money from or who can be an account aggregator. But what RBI has done is they have introduced another key concept, uh, which is they have said that this should be a competitive oligopoly, just like the telecom sector. If you're unhappy with one telco, there is a finite number of players in the market and then you can churn and you can take your business to another, another telco. So that's uh, very much part of the RBI idea, which wasn't there in the iSpirit idea. As far as iSpirit was concerned, you could have infinite number of consent collectors. So that was uh, the second version of the idea. The third idea doesn't build on uh, idea one and two. It's an idea from a legal scholar based in Bangalore. His name is Navi or Na Vijayshankar. Uh, he has a blog. Uh, which is navi.org, and you can see most of his research on this blog. What Navi does is he builds upon the idea of an escrow agency uh, in cryptography, and I'm assuming some of you at least have followed the cryptography debates, uh, especially the first phase of the crypto wars in the US. Escrow for people who talk about cryptography is always a bad idea. <laughs> but here this is not... Uh, key escrow that we are discussing. What we are discussing here is uh, PI or personal information escrow. So your data, you give all your PI to the data trust, your data trust. Again, there can be infinite number of uh, data trusts. And whenever the data controller, whenever the fintech company or Facebook or the bank want your personal information, you instruct your data trust uh, to give that information on to the data controller. So that's the model. 
So it's a real time system and in his proposal, uh, he believes that these should be firms with enough computing and storage power to be able to in real time process requests from the data subject to send data to the data controller. So that is uh, Navi's idea, very interesting idea. Navi says that uh, there should be three requirements. Uh, these data trusts must have public performance reviews so that people can choose the right data trust they want to deal with. Uh, they should have audits by the regulator and an arm's length relationship with data controllers. That means data controllers, they shouldn't be able to make money from the fintech company and they shouldn't be able to make money from the bank. They should have some other revenue stream. Donavi does not uh, tell us exactly what that should be. Um, Navi sees them playing other roles as well, such as translating privacy notices into local languages, Canada, for example, or just making them accessible. Uh, and uh, issuing tokens or pseudonymous identifiers, these are all the roles that Navi sees for these data trusts. Uh, so th that's uh, perhaps the most recently proposed idea because Navi did this a day before Justice Sri Krishna came to Bangalore for his open house discussion. An earlier idea that has been put together by the Takshashila Institution, or published by the Takshashila Institution more accurately, but authored by a Bangalore based uh, lawyer called Rahul Mathan, who is a founder partner of one of India's most well known technology law firms, uh, Trilegal. I'm not sure, maybe they uh, would like to characterize themselves differently, but one of, their, one of the things they're known about uh, or known of is their technology practice. So Rahul is not so much concerned with the privacy harms that might emerge uh, in the ecosystem. He's looking very particularly at the discrimination harms. So that is what he is particularly uh, worried about, that uh, big data and artificial intelligence can be used to discriminate against certain vulnerable populations. So he thinks that learned intermediaries will be able to solve these discrimination harms by raising the amount of awareness that the customer has. So it is very much like caveat emptor in many parts of regulation the government will not do anything. The government will say, all we expect the regulated parties to do, for example, tobacco companies, is to put warnings on their labels or food companies to tell you how much sodium or sugar is in their products. And a knowledgeable customer will be able to choose in the marketplace. So that is what uh, Rahul is aiming at fixing. According to his problem statement, there is an information asymmetry and the best way to deal with the information asymmetry is to make uh, these black boxes and these corporations more transparent, their practices more transparent. So there are three stages of uh, review for both uh, big data and AI products. The first is a database query review. All of you are technologists, I want you to think how feasible this might be. The second are black box audits without knowing what is in the box you test it from outside. And the third is algorithm review, which for me was even harder to fully understand uh, because there is many a slip between the algorithm and the code implementation, right? The same algorithm could be implemented in many uh, different ways. Uh, algorithm gives us a amount of tra abstraction, which when you finally do the implementation, you might have flexibility there. So this is what uh, he hopes will happen. And uh, he hopes that these intermediaries will be certified by the regulator. So there will be a finite number of them, not, uh, uh, but anybody who meets the certification requirements will of course become a learned intermediary. So finally, my own model, which I've been cooking up at the Center for Internet and Society, building off the work done at iSpirit. And what I'm really doing is, and the RBI really, because that is one historical trajectory, 
What I am trying to do is just make two fixes. The first fix is I want to borrow from Navi's idea that there should be an arm's length distance. So, in my fix, there will be a clear prohibition. The consent collector or the account aggregator cannot make money from data controllers. They can only make money from the data subject or the citizen. That is uh, fix number one. And fix number two is what uh, RBI has already done, which is you have a competitive oligopoly. You have only 50 uh, consent brokers in uh, the country. And uh, this, I hope, will solve the problem that the account aggregators face today. So we have, I think, 18 or so account aggregators that have been given the license. All of them are not sure at all what their revenue models should be. And as far as I have heard, as far as I have heard, none of them have broken even, none of them have uh, revenue streams that they are happy with. So with the consent broker, we could potentially start off with the uh, other uh, ecosystem. <laughs> so there is uh, direct benefits transfer uh, to vulnerable populations. Uh, it is basically a reinvention of our welfare state. Previously, welfare was product provided in products and services. And now we are shifting to a regime where welfare will be provided as cash in your bank account, directly put into your account using cashless mechanisms. Um, so everybody that gets 100 rupees of welfare from the state, uh, they would have to necessarily give away one rupee to the consent uh, broker. So overnight, the 50 consent brokers that exist in the market will all have revenue streams, at least from the bottom of the pyramid, because uh, they are now dealing with these people as paying customers. Then they can start doing the innovation I'd like to see, which I never hear at fintech uh, companies, uh, uh, conferences and conversations. Usually the innovation at a fintech conference is the innovation where a firm will make more money. And that's, that's why everybody is excited about these innovations. I'm interested in the innovations that uh, result in firms making less money. That's the kind of innovation I'm interested in. For example, I have uh, borrowed 12 years ago from a bank and I'm still paying my bank loan. And uh, I'm certain that my bank is gouging me as far as they can for uh, various interest rates. I have never met in my lifetime a single person who has taken a loan from a bank and is happy with the way the bank is treating this person. So. Uh, I would love if all the uh, 5,000 people who are upset with my bank in Bangalore come together thanks to our consent broker. And the consent broker, uh, on my behalf and on the behalf of the 5,000 or 10,000 people, aggrieved customers of this bank, go to the bank and say, we want the historical interest rates. This is, if you ask your bank, to give you this piece of information, which is directly connected to what you're doing, uh, it's very difficult to get this information. What was the interest rate at each point across the 12 years of paying the interest back to the bank? And then the banks can say, oh, we noticed that the bank is treating the following customers badly. We can, as a block, take your business to another bank. You know, So it's uh, raising the collective negotiating power of the consumer. So I believe there can be a whole range of innovations that are possible if the intermediary, thanks to their bottom line, has to first pledge their allegiance to the data subject and not to the data controllers. So that is how I'm trying to reorganize the incentives uh, within the proposal that uh, iSpirit and the RBI have made to make the incentives work, to ensure revenue streams for these intermediaries and so on. So that is um, uh, my uh, final addition. There are some other proposals that people at Internet Democracy Project, there is a woman in Bangalore called Nayantara, 
she is uh, at least at the Shri Krishna, Justice Shri Krishna committee meeting, she made a proposal that we should have collective redressal systems. So, the scenario that she is painting is there is a bunch of citizens that have been wronged, uh, either discrimination harms or privacy harms, and once they have been wronged, they should be able to approach uh, the regulator or the courts as a collective and then get redress for their, uh, uh, for the harms that they have suffered. Uh, when we introduce an intermediary, it's not a post facto measure really. We are not trying to deal with the problems after they have happened. Uh, with an intermediary, what is really going on is you are trying to empower the customer or the citizen uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so, suppose uh, there is a particular data controller and they have managed to compromise your accounts, then a consent broker should be able to proactively uh, protect my interest by requesting for my data to be deleted or my uh, account credentials to be changed and so on. So that is the vision that we have. Why is it that we are talking of such uh, strange ideas in India? Because we have an advantage. Unlike the European Union, which has a 37 year history behind its data protection regime, from its very first data protection law, we are starting with what you could call tabula rasa or blank slate. So therefore, uh, there is an opportunity to leapfrog. Ideally, what we need as a nation is a data protection regime that is considered adequate by the regulators in the European Union. But the European Union has gotten there uh, through some really heavy and onerous regulation. That type of onerous regulation may be inappropriate in a jurisdiction where data protection regulation has just begun. So therefore, there are some creative uh, approaches that we should explore here, what I would call regulatory innovations, because as long as we can demonstrate to, to the European regulators that in spite of taking a different route, the customer has similar protections or the data subject has similar protections, I am almost certain that the European regulators will consider us data adequate. Uh, and then the trade in personal information, uh, personal information flowing from Europe to Indian BPOs, uh, KPOs, and uh, other types of service, ITES organizations will continue. So that is that's the goal uh, to make to take a different path than the path that was taken in in the European Union. So that's my talk. I think I'm <laughs> even shorter than what I thought I would take. My apologies. But this is perhaps an uh, opportunity for you to ask any questions. It can be connected to intermediaries or perhaps not. And if you don't have questions, I'm also happy to get out of your way immediately. Thank you.